There's no nukes, my lord, there's no nukes. There's no nukes, my lord, there's no nukes. I'd rather hug a tree, cause radiation gives you the pukes. Oh lord, let's have no nukes. There's a reason I'm singing this today. And this is important to me. I don't believe there are any nuclear devices. Not in the United States arsenal, not in the Soviet arsenal. You know why? Because we have way too much experience to be that stupid, that foolish. If you like me to, I will define the difference between stupidity and foolishness. Stupidity is a lack of the ability to process information and make rational decisions based on the process of that information. A fool, on the other hand, is a person who loves intemperately. Fanatics are usually fools, I'm sorry to say it. Anyway, the idea of nuclear devices, in my opinion already, is a foolish and a stupid idea. And I have reasons for thinking that there are none, that this whole thing is a massive con of all the world's peoples on the part of a few very, incredibly, you would not understand how much it means, like trillion dollar bribery, greedy men. So, here's where we start. 1949, 1950, uh, we're turning up, a lot of people working in the processing facilities are turning up with weird cancers. Well, where the heck are these coming from? Well, probable cause, ionizing radiation. Probable source, the radioactive material you're working with. It's ionizing radiation emitter, even in small amounts, just in a very low scale. But the more you refine it, the more readily it, it uh, emits ionizing radiation. As a matter of fact, the more dense that ionizing radiation is, the closer you get to the, to the piece of uranium, to the ball, to the sample. So, X amount of uranium in a nuclear device, or X amount of plutonium, I'm not going to like give amounts here, there's no reason to. All the information is freely available. In some ways that's a good idea, in some ways it's a bad idea. But there is information that isn't available. What happens to your technicians that breathe the dust or that breathe the uh, uranium hexafluoride gas that, yes, will leak from fittings, and yes, workers are at risk, and yes, the byproducts of uranium on every level are generally poisonous or toxic. Uranium itself is one of the most potent poisonous materials known to man. They don't say that ever, but yeah. Handling uranium is handling poison. All those guys that say, this is safe as hell, I can eat this stuff. Look at my Geiger counter, just doesn't even get a heart on. Well, they're lying. They're giving you a crock of shit, pardon my language. Uranium is extremely dangerous. It's pyrophoric, which means it bursts into flame. <laughs> when it's that refined uranium will burst into flame, will explode, you know, when it's, uh, uh, it comes into contact with the air. Uh, it's very difficult to store, it's very difficult to produce, it's very difficult to refine, to concentrate, and to store. And it's so intensely radioactive in that state, when it's ready to be made into a, a warhead, that it will damage the molecular structure of just about anything close by. The metal of its container becomes radioactive. Yes, it does talk about the Bomark missile. Look that up for yourself. The, the guidance system, if it's electronic, quickly becomes destroyed. It be degrades from emission of ionizing radiation. It creates breaks in important molecular chains in the copper of your circuit board or you know the platinum of your connectors or whatever. So it changes parameters inside the warhead, and the more radioactive it gets, the more interference there is until something like a PC uh, processor could not function because the environment would be far too radioactive, far too ionizing, far too interfering because that ionizing radiation creates noise in computers. Noise in data, uh, noise in uh, uh, execution, noise in the uh, in the processing, like I said, of that. So, you can't put a guidance system close to the warhead. 
because in a very short time that guidance system will become compromised. You can't put a warhead's amount of, u of uranium or plutonium inside a metal container and expect it to just sit there because it's going to ionize the metal of the container and it's going to create radioactive isotopes inside that metal which will be poisonous and, and dangerous, cancer-causing to your technicians and the people that work around your missile or your bomb or your little David Mortar round, whatever. Excuse me. Oh, my eyes are going blurry. <laughs> So the United States started losing technicians to cancers, a lot of them. And then they started thinking, well, maybe this stuff is as poisonous as, you know, who knows. Then there was the Demon Corps accident, which sort of showed that we were playing with nuclear fire. We didn't know what we were doing. The doctors still thought you could just, like, prop open a nuclear core with a, with a screwdriver and, like, do little experiments for fun, which ended up killing some people. Uh, not the doctors are known for... Great wisdom. As a matter of fact, the opposite of great wisdom is foolishness, you see. Love intemperately. I love science intemperately, so I'm a little silly when it comes to endangering myself and other people. Uh, Mary and Pierre Curie, uh, you know, anyone that pushed radium water in the 20s and 30s. Okay, so the people that promoted freezing the patient as a cure or a slowing down for cancers. How miserable that must have been. So anyway, the nuclear device has to be assembled fairly quickly. You have to store the uranium uh, as spread out as you can get it and then only concentrate it in a very short period of time, which means either you have a very weird system of shelving or you'll have to refine the uranium from the ore on the spot so to speak. You know, like, okay, we need X number of warheads. All right, we'll pump them out. They'll be ready at 8 o'clock tonight. Okay. And then once those warheads are assembled, they have to be prepared to be launched or to be dropped. They have to be installed into their, uh, into their delivery system. I'm going to use missiles as the delivery system of choice here because two-thirds of our nuclear... Uh, deterrent is uh, missiles. So you can only leave that warhead in the missile for a short time. Now you might say to me, well, Bill, that's no problem. They'll just put shielding around the missile. Well, do a little bit of reading about NASA and weight fractions because on a missile, most of the weight is in fuel and a good deal of the rest of the weight is in payload. In other words, uh, well, I should say payload, yeah. But I mean specifically warhead, the exploding part, right? And then there's guidance and, you know, various other systems. Um, you don't have much weight room for lead on a missile. Nor do you on a nuclear submarine. I have things to say about that, too. Lucky for us, uh, water is a moderator. But I don't think it's the effortless free one that we act like it is. So anyway, it seems to me from this bit of information I have and from reading up on nuclear devices, reading up on the effects of ionizing radiation and how radiation breakdown, uh, you know, uh, nuclear reactions become much more frequent the more concentrated the material is. And when you're making a warhead, that's the most concentrated it ever gets. So this stuff is fairly snapping with radioactivity. You wouldn't want to hold the, war f the warhead core, I'm not going to make it a, a gesture, in your hands. You wouldn't. I mean, you would visibly burn. That's how much ionizing radiation is coming out of it. As a matter of fact, it wants to fly apart. It's only when you add a little bit more. I just need a little bit more. A little bit more energy added. And it, oh, it flies apart like hell. So, matter of fact, a nuclear bomb is based on a very, very careful balance of the force going out of the detonation, right, which is the natural thing it wants to disperse, and 
the force that's directed inward to continue to concentrate the reaction as long as possible because if you just put the material together until it was uh, supercritical, it would merely explode and fly into pieces and poison your whole region. It wouldn't go off like a nuclear device. It would just like a giant pyrophoric explosion. Not the same thing. Oh my gosh, and then you just have poisonous glowing bits of uranium laying around. So, and byproducts. So it looks evident that you can't have a nuclear warhead on a submarine. You can't have it in a silo, because if you did, it would make everything around it radioactive. That's going to interfere with all your electronics. It's going to interfere with all your optronics. It's going to interfere with everything that uses electrons or photons for data transmission. You have nothing that's going to shield it well enough on a missile or a submarine or a on a bomber, you know, in a dumb bomb. You can't carry that much lead. So, <coughs> they started losing technicians, right? And then you were losing bomber pilots, right? To, you know, elevated uh, uh, levels of cancers. And odd cancers, unusual ones that you wouldn't see otherwise, which is what we have seen from the results of our nuclear test program in general. Cancers that don't seem to appear in the human race till very lately. So anyway, what you have is you have an untenable weapon system. The Soviets can't stick a nuclear warhead on a missile somewhere out on a Siberian plane and just let it sit there for 6, 20 years and then set it off. It would be so radioactive all the metal of the missile would be so radioactive. All the metal in the silo would be radioactive. Anyone that had worked around it for any length of time would be dying. Or severely uh, severely affected by ionizing radiation. You may decide at what level you would like to interface your data. But generally, ionizing radiation is not good for humans. And anything that emits x-rays, not good for humans. Otherwise, the doctor wouldn't stand behind a shield, would he? I didn't think so. So anyway. All of this stuff is counterproductive when it comes to making a missile with a warhead, nuclear warhead, with a dependable guidance system that has a long shelf life. And everyone that works with uranium eventually dies of something horrible. Maybe not everyone. Some humans are amazing. They, they seem to have the ability to endure ionizing radiation at what we would otherwise consider to be impossible levels. I am not the arbiter of the human genome, so I can't tell you who will live and who won't, but I'll bet a lot of them got very sick. Remember, this is a wild bill spin. There is no external evidence for this except the things that you will hear that are resonances with reality in my little story here, of which there have been several so far. So the United States and the Soviet Union glowering at each other, right? Uh, they had uh, uh, Soviet-era um, uh, IS-2 tanks uh, uh, staring down a road in Germany. And uh, we had uh, patents, I think maybe early in the 60s, not sure at that time, during the Cold War. Uh, and I had a friend who was assigned to a tank battalion, and that was his job for a short period of time, was to sit there and look at the, you should pardon the expression, Ruskies. You know, and uh, they had these uh, five-inch guns, and uh, you had a 90-millimeter gun. And the, everyone said to you that your 90-millimeter gun was going to go right through that Russian tank. And they were telling the Russians that their 122-millimeter gun was going to go right through our tank. And it was likely that that 122-millimeter round would knock out a U.S. tank from the strike. As far as a 90-millimeter against an IS-2, well, the Germans did that with the famed 88, which had very similar uh, uh, performance values. The only difference being they, the United States made a very powerful SABA round. They call it the high VAP, high velocity armor piercing round, which you know and, uh, imparts a much larger velocity to a smaller diameter projectile. But I digress. Getting back to nuclear power, my friend was in a uh, tank staring across a little space in Germany at uh, Soviet Union tankers. You know, uh, the one side's. Uh, Singing, I don't know what, 
born to be wild. <laughs> One side's doing rock and roll, and the other side's uh, singing Little Kate, you know, or whatever. And uh, otherwise, they're pretty much boys and girls just like us, right? And they were all going to kill each other. And during this time, this standoff, as it were, uh, in over Germany, someone on the American side probably talked to someone on the Russian side, and the conversation likely went like this. My leader wants to discuss with your leader the fact that it's very difficult to maintain a nuclear arsenal because we keep losing our most highly trained technicians to serious cancers. Makes it hard to pin the medals on. And I'm guessing that the other leader's um, you know, advisor or uh, you know, negotiator said, well, yes, our leader has been talking about that too in back room sessions. And we would like to not have to kill our best trained men, our best college grads, our most, uh, the glory, pardon my language, the gloria mundi of our educational systems. What do you think we can do about it? Because we're not going to like stop building nukes as long as you're building nukes, and you're not going to stop building nukes because you Americans are crazy. And eventually, through intermediaries, they came up with a thought. You know, the two of us share something in common. We both want to keep our plebes, our polity, completely baffled, spinning around like puppies, chasing their tail, so they don't combine in case they might want to oust us from power. That's the the prerogative of the ruling class. That's how it is everywhere, all the time. There is no other way. Ruling classes seek to preserve their prerogative to rule. There is no other function available to them but that. They never just slide back into society. So, I believe, this is my alternate history, that the United States and the Soviet Union made an agreement. Well, we're going to pull a Star Trek on you here. You have 320 virtual nukes, and we have 327 virtual nukes. And you have more missiles on your for your nukes, but fewer nukes can be carried per missile. And we have more missiles on our nukes, but fewer missiles overall. Now, that would do a few things, one of which, you could take all that money that's pouring into developed nuclear devices and create a self-fulfilling cash cow for these entitled people in the uranium procurement, refinery, and warhead manufacture process. And they don't even have to do a day of work. They just have to be purchasable. And a little less unwise than the people that think that nuclear arms is a good way to preserve peace. Just a little less credulous. These guys who protect their money aren't going to talk. Nobody in the press is going to give you enough money to make you leave that system. That's probably paying everybody that's in it, that knows about it, a lot of money under the table. We don't see where that money goes. We don't know where the money goes from arms manufacturers because we do find that it's like turning up in people's pockets like mad. You know, generals' pockets, people in charge of procurement. They tend to end up with like nice little things, Ferraris and Maseratis and hot hookers you know, out of nowhere. What they call a honey tr honey pot trap. Uh, courtesy of the arms manufacturing people. It's, it's in the public record. I'm not kidding or exaggerating. Uh, Bofors, Lockheed, General Dynamics, uh, Vickers. And of course, various Soviet manufacturers have all been implicated in this sort of like large scale deception and culture of bribery. Just so I'm not making this up or being a conspiracy theorist in any bad way. Though those who do not suspect conspiracies do not understand the human psyche. So, anyway, there can't be any nuclear bombs, there can't be any nuclear warheads, there can be missiles on a pad. There can be missiles in a submarine tube. 
there can be uh, things that look like a bomb that give the right readings out on everything on a B-52 or a, you know, in the missile bay of a B-52 or a B-2 bomber or B-1. But there can't be nuclear devices aboard because if there are, they will scramble the electronics of the B-2 or the B-1B uh, or you know, whatever you put them on, eventually those nuclear devices are going to ruin it. They're going to ruin it with ionizing radiation. It's a fact of life with uranium. That's why a Geiger counter is basically, you know, a radio receiver. The interference from radiation, from ionized radiation. That's like radio noise. Cosmic microwave background. That, that astronomers are, um, I could call them astronomists because they're fanboys, uh, believe that is the background noise from the creation of the universe. Uh, that's uh, radio noise. That's ionizing radiation. Three centimeter wavelength, is it? Something like that. But anyway, it's unlikely that they're going to build aircraft carriers, that they're going to build missile armed submarines, that they're going to build uh, missile armed Arleigh Burks, that they're going to build ships that today cost $10 billion, and that isn't to arm them, that's just to launch them and equip them. To arm them, the missiles are pricey today, is a lot. And to arm something with a nuclear missile, or 16 nuclear missiles, or 12 nuclear tip missiles, uh, is an enormous expense. You know how we complain, some of us, that uh, NASA like, just soaks up all that money for nothing, and NASA says, what are you talking about, we live on a shoestring here? Well. NASA just launches a few rockets, but we have X amount, look it up on Wikipedia, uh, X amount of uh, what we call boomers, uh, nuclear missile, nuclear ballistic missile launching submarines, and the Soviets have X number. Uh, they have a lot fewer, and they have fewer missiles as well nowadays. But they have some, some practical abilities that we don't have. They can keep their nuclear-powered submarines closer to their home waters, and they're still closer to our major centers. So, in terms of missile, you know, accuracy and range, um, that gives them a small advantage. But they're a much smaller number of submarines, and the fact that our navy is confident that it can keep track of those submarines, uh, I don't have any insider knowledge. But I get the idea that the United States Navy is fairly competent at this whole tracking enemy submarines thing. We're not perfect. No one's perfect. Well, maybe some porno star somewhere is perfect, but I can't afford to buy those movies, so all I got left is Wikipedia. Here's another thing about your nuclear missiles. If you're launching them from land, like the Soviets will launch some of theirs from land and we'll launch some of ours from land. Did you know, just go back and watch the recent launches. Not every missile launch is successful. Now think about that for a second. We're going to launch 100 nuclear missiles in Kansas, you know, Wyoming, place, Nevada, places like that. And those missiles don't teleport to the Soviet Union and explode. They pass over a considerable chunk of America and Canada. Hey. And not all of those missiles are going to make it, and not all of them are going to come down close to their intended target. Those missiles are a percentage game. That's a game of uh, lawn darts with some fairly good ballistics attached, i got to say. Oh, my gosh. The ballistic missiles of today are the ballistic missiles of yesterday. So what we basically have today is a V-2 missile from World War II. We said that the engine's going to burn so long, and that's going to give it so much, impart so much velocity. The air resistance going up and coming back is going to you know, slow it down so much. It should drop right about there. That's what we're using to defend our country. That's what the Soviets believe will defend their country, is this game of hit or miss, with missiles that are not 100% fail-safe. So a bunch of those missiles, when we launch or when they launch, are going to spew radioactive warhead components across the countryside of the people that they were pledged to protect. 
And this is why I don't believe in nuclear power as a deterrent. I don't believe in nuclear power as an answer. I believe it is a question that should have been solved a long time ago. And there is an enormous scam going on to keep the people blinded so that we're complaining about the welfare, we're complaining about socialism in America, not realizing that, of course, there's already corporate socialism. It's called tax credits already. So anyway, we just don't have socialism down here. Up at the top, woo, they all get paid on the public bill. So anyway, I don't believe they can keep a reasonable nuclear arsenal functional for any length of time, which means you're going to be constantly refining new warhead material as the old warhead material becomes unstable or, you know, as the stuff around it becomes ruined, you have to remove the warhead material and people have to do this. You know, the robots aren't very dependable either. They start to break down. Look at the Fukushima. Look at how hard it was to develop robots that will do all this. And, of course, the only people that had them were... Mm -hmm. Yes, the Acme Company, Warner Brothers, uh, brought those to the public attention. Wiley Coyote is the only person that knows how to order from them. I'd like their catalog. But having robots that work comfortably well and can be controlled from a distance in that the robots are working in highly radioactive environments, those are incredibly expensive. They're like an order of magnitude more expensive than you would expect them to be. And somebody has to maintain those, and somebody has to buy those, and repair those, and maintain those, as I said. And they're going to break down working around intensely radioactive material, like the storage areas where fissile uranium, well, warhead-grade uranium is kept. And of course, the concrete walls are going to become radioactive. The metal is going to become radioactive. Everything around this high refined uranium, highly radioactive uranium, is going to become radioactive. Now, your saving grace, of course, is that thermal neutrons don't go far, which are the, uh, they are part of the bugaboo of uh, radiation poisoning. Uh, but, you know, alpha particles are going to go wherever they go and land wherever they land, and they're not good for you. And uh, ionizing radiation, x-rays, Stuff like that is going to be gamma is really going to get you. So anyway, I don't believe it's possible to keep a high, the highest technological uh, uh, artifice of the human species is in making, storing, and delivering these absolutely deadly nuclear devices. Not just deadly to the people they're dropped on, but deadly to everybody has to work around them. Poisonous, poisonous, poisonous. Uh, the gases it emits are poisonous. Uh, you know, just from breaking down, there's like tiny amounts of gas being released. That's poisonous stuff. Of course, there's uranium hexafluoride from the purification process, probably still leaking out of it. And that's, whew, wow. That's like, you know, like nicotine on a spider kind of stuff. So, um, A long time ago, I was thinking about this. My ideas about this came from these thoughts probably 25 years ago. And I thought, you know, that uranium and fissile materials will eventually make radioactive any container. That means that radioactive power plants do that too, that nuclear power plants do that too, that the containment of the fuel rods is going to become ra radioactive over time. It can't not. And so they would have to replace these. And, of course, they call it midlife refueling, and, you know, they have all these project names for it. But nowadays they're trying to develop reactors for warships, get this, that last the whole life of the ship. They don't want to dick with it. They want it to be a union, a unit. And nobody ever goes around or near it. I'm saying this is at the end of a long line of discovery by losing highly trained technicians to radiation sickness and poisoning. And now they're finally getting wise. But that many years ago, they realized that about the warheads. They're even worse than the power plants. And they thought, we can barely keep people alive working around the power plant materials. And there are still accidents. You people don't realize what a great disaster Three Mile Island was, because it was downplayed so well by a yellow press. How close we came to a disaster that would still be talked about today, worldwide, instead of joked about. <laughs> 
as look, America, you know, dodged a bullet. No, no, we dodged an asteroid strike there, in the heart of a civilized and uh, educated polity. The people that support our government, the people that are the salt of the American dream, you know, salt on the burger. So anyway, I was postulating years ago about this. Well, if that were the case, then the, then the Soviet Union, whose technology in some aspects lags behind ours, especially the ability to create certain kinds of machinery to perform certain tasks very well with close tolerances, may have a hell of a time with all this, with the fact that your reactors, your, you know, your piles become contaminated too. They become lethal for the crew to work around. You have to take them out. You have to replace not only the nuclear material to refuel a nuclear submarine, you have to take the whole containment out and then put it in again, a new one, a fresh one. So, and when I thought that, I had a friend that says that's unlikely. Everybody, as a matter of fact, I talked to said that's unlikely. And I went on to one of my friends at this time, 25 years ago, well, if what I'm saying is true, then the Soviets somewhere have a submarine graveyard where there are nuclear radioact nuclear powered radioactive decommissioned submarines sitting somewhere on a spit in the ice, poisoning the whole environment. Doggone if there isn't one. Just like that. So my ideas aren't as crazy as everyone's gonna spin them. My ideas are right on the line here. Yes. Nuclear reactors do make poisonous, make radioactive everything around them. And yes, you have to keep this in mind when you're building and maintaining nuclear reactors. Your container is going to become contaminated. That means you have to replace it. On a warship, more of that. I mean, you've got people around you all the time. Any kind of accident isn't like a nuclear power plant. If you're on a, if you're on a carrier, 3,000, 2,000 of the most highly trained men in the world are at risk from any kind of accident on a reactor on a carrier. So anyway, which is why we're now trying to develop a reactor that will just take one charging and you'll never even look at it, right? It, what I call NUSP, N-U-S-P, no user serviceable parts. And that's how we plan on doing this. It's still way too deadly, way too dangerous. And the detritus that's left behind from nuclear power cannot be dealt with, cannot be neutralized, cannot be made safe for human habitation ever, not ever. So this is no answer to anything. This is just a terrible existential threat that continues to be held over our head, even when the people that are employing it are waving a peace flag around. Scary. So that's my alternative history for you. There are no nicks. I mean, there might be in Pakistan because they haven't learned a lesson yet. I doubt there are in India anymore because I'll bet they've learned their lesson. And other places, Israel, who've had access to American research, you people don't realize how extensive the Israeli um, espionage system is. It has been, I think, the standard in the world for 50 years. There's nothing like it. They have moles everywhere. And many of them are our friends. You'd like them, I like them. Scary, isn't it? So anyway, and they've got, wait, they've got moles in the Soviet system in the Rush, now the Russian system, and I'll bet they got moles in India, and I'll bet they got moles in South Africa. Well, they have to have moles in South Africa, because those two developed the nuke together. Read about the uh, day the sky flashed twice, and uh, you'll read more on that. So that's Wild Bill for today, rambling lecture on the alternative history in which I predict that there are no nukes.